All right, now, um, basically, basically the platypus is, is regarded as one of the world's most unusual mammals. And I won't go into huge amounts of detail about that because, but the sort of things that make it fascinating, firstly, it's a, it's a mammal that reproduces by laying eggs. And you can see the eggs in a jar there at the museum in the picture in the middle bottom. Um, the eggs themselves are, are not hard like a bird's egg. They're basically soft and leathery, so very similar to reptile eggs. There's something else that's a bit reptilian about platypus, and that's the fact they're venomous. Now, it's only the males that have the venom, and they have spurs on each of their hind ankles, which is where the venom can be expelled from. Uh, the venom, it won't kill you, but it's, it will cause a lot of pain if you do get spurred. But what the spurs are really there for is for the males to fight with each other during the breeding season to determine the, the dominant uh, breeding ones. Um, various special features, but the one that really stands out, I suppose, is the platypus bill with this weird uh, looking structure on its face. It's not hard like a duck's bill at all. It's actually quite soft and bendy, but it's where the platypus has a genuine sixth sense. Basically, what it's got is an, an, an electroreception system. That's a big word for saying what it does is scan and detects the tiny amount of electricity that some of the food items it's chasing, such as freshwater yabbies and so on, they produce a tiny amount of electricity and the scanning system picks it up. So there are all sorts of other features that I won't go into that really make this one of the, the world's most unusual mammals. And if you had to draw up a list of world heritage species, this would be right up there. Now, where does the platypus occur? Basically down the eastern side of Australia and including Tasmania. Um, on the dry western margins, there's already a bit of evidence that populations are starting to shrink back a bit. So in Victoria, we've seen a significant decline in the Wimmera in the very western part of the state. Uh, but we're lucky that in the ACT Queen Bianne region, it's still pretty much in the sort of heartland of platypus area at all. So, um, you know, the, there is the possibility that with climate change, we'll see the edges starting to shrink first, but that makes it even more important that the populations around uh, Queen Bian and so on are protected for the future. Where does the platypus occur? Well, I guess if you asked a lot of people and stop them in the street, they'll say, well, you know, the platypus, it's such a special animal and, oh, you know, it's shy and it's sensitive. So, you know, they don't, don't occur around here. And if you, if you say to them, well, you know, describe where they do uh, occur, they'd probably say something like that top left photo there. They'd say, oh, you know, it's beautiful, fast flowing, clear water and it's forests and there's no people and so on. And of course you would get platypus there, but you can get platypus in fairly uh, modified rivers, such as the one on the top right there, that's the Murrumbidgee, uh, just outside the ACT. They occur in fairly small creeks, like the one in the middle there. They occur in a wide range of, of still water conditions, both dams and uh, reservoirs and farm dams even, so like and recreation lakes and so on, like the one on the, the bottom left there. But also, of course, they can, under certain circumstances, occur right next to people in urban areas, such as our picture on the bottom right there of the center of Queen Bianne. Now, I want to emphasize you won't get platypus equally in those sort of areas. Platypus are a very good habitat indicator. In other words, the better the quality of environmental conditions, the more platypus you will get per kilometer. So you will get many, many more platypus in the top left picture there than you will in the Queen Bian area. But having said that, the point I really want to make is that platypus do not live way off there, way off in the bush, far from people. Platypus can and do live close to people. And probably more than half of the human population in Eastern Australia live within a few kilometers of the species. And this is very important because the things that we do can be both good and bad for platypus. Now, what do platypus eat? Well, they're, they're a fairly generalized feeder. Uh, most of their food consists of bugs that live in the water. So things up to about the size of freshwater yabbies. Uh, because they don't have teeth, they're a bit limited. They have grinding pads to mash food up. And so if they try and catch bigger things, they really have to sort of gum them to death. But basically, they can do that with things like uh, fish and so on. They will catch small fish occasionally, as you can see in that photo there. So they're a very generous feeder. And the important thing about them is they, they're very good at switching from 
whatever is in season at the moment. And so they are uh, a very quite resilient species in, in many respects. They are a very high energy species uh, in terms of their swimming around in cold conditions and burning up lots of energy. So consequently, they have to eat a lot. Um, a platypus to stay in good condition needs something like 20 to 40% of its body mass every 24 hour period to stay in good condition. So that's a lot of food, but in round figures, about a kilo of bugs per day. And that's a lot of feeding it's got to do. Now that then has implications for the way that platypus organizes itself. The first thing is they don't occur in herds of platypus. If you've got lots and lots of platypus in one place, they would very quickly eat themselves out of house and home. So they occur at fairly low densities. If we take the Queen Bien River, most of it you're probably looking at two to three platypus per kilometer would be what we would reasonably expect. So not hundreds of animals. The second factor is a platypus isn't going to find all its food all in one place day after day after day. They're going to move up and down looking for food. And consequently, they have fairly long home ranges. Um, females have typically a, a, a home range of about a kilometre, but the males can perhaps have sometimes six, seven kilometre home ranges. And this again is what we would expect in the Queen Bean River, that the females are, as I said, occupy short home ranges, but the males will come, come and go and move in quite significantly. And that's why you get sort of fluctuations in the base level of how many platypus are around at any one point in time, depending on where it is in the season and how the food resources are. Now, they're a, a quite long-lived animal for a small mammal. Um, they can live more than 25 years. There's one in Hillsville Sanctuary in Victoria at the moment that is 27 years long. Um, and we've known some in the wild that are well into their 20s. That's probably a bit exceptional. Um, we think the typical age range is probably about 14 to 16 for the females, perhaps 10 to 12 for the males. Um, they uh, are fairly good at reproducing. There's no evidence at all that uh, platypus have any, have any reproductive problems in the wild. They typically have one or two juveniles per litter. They can lay three eggs, but that's quite exceptional. Um, they become mature in about their second year of, of age, sexually mature, but they probably don't necessarily start breeding straight away. And over their lifespan, um, a female will probably on average produce litters about one year in every two, depending on conditions. In good years, they might produce two juveniles. In a bad year, if there's a drought, they won't breed at all. But the point is over a relatively long lifetime, they will produce more than enough offspring to uh, replace themselves in the population. And what this means is that in a stable population, a lot of the juveniles are basically surplus to requirements. And so the juveniles have quite a high mortality rate. Mating basically occurs in the spring, around about August, October is the, is the peak of the breeding season. Um, the eggs hatch about a month after mating. So typically October is when most of the, the eggs are hatched. And the young then grow very rapidly because the females produce a very rich milk that's high in iron, high in fat. And they grow, as you can see in that picture on the right, they're into little, little butter balls, basically, and start to emerge in about late January, February, when they're already about two thirds fully grown. After that, what I said, there's a lot of pressure on the juveniles eventually to move out. Um, in about this time of the year, May, June, uh, the adults decide when they don't really want the juveniles competing with for them for food and a lot of them get pushed out to go and find new territories, particularly the males. And that's when a lot of them don't, don't make it. They often end up in really peculiar places. A lot of them get picked off by predators and a lot of them simply starve to death. So it's a tough life being a young juvenile platypus, but that's the way that platypus are very, very good at keeping their populations in balance with their resources. Now, how is the platypus doing in the wild? Well, the answer, unfortunately, is not as good as we would like. The most recent action plan for Australian mammals that was a, a CSIRO expert panel in 2012 
um, classify the, the platypus as near threatened on a national basis. And that's the uh, classification that's subsequently been adopted by the World Conservation Union's Red List. Now, what that really means, it's an alarm bell. It's saying, look, this species has declined in many catchments and we don't really know, you know how populations are doing across the board. And some of the causes of that decline are still going on. And so we really start to need to concentrate some action on this species before it becomes any more threatened. Now, what are some of the problems? Well, I guess we're, we're all aware that since European settlement, we've made a bit of a mess of our river systems and the sort of things that have occurred. We've cleared a lot of the, the vegetation that occurred on our riverbanks. And so you get situations like that top picture on the left there where erosion is taking place. And if you're a platypus, that's not going to be a great place to put your burrows. Likewise, that erosion then leads to sedimentation, as you can see on the top left, the top right there. And the sediment buildup in some of our rivers, uh, in general terms, bugs don't do as well in that sort of silty, sandy conditions. So less bugs means less platypus. We've still got management issues, such as the one on the bottom uh, left there, where we have issues of stock still trampling banks, making it very difficult for platypus burrows, but in addition, polluting the water in various ways. And of course, we've got a whole suite of introduced weeds, both in the water itself or along our riverbanks in the form of willows and all sorts of other introduced species. And so consequently, uh, all that productivity has been reduced tr tremendously from a, a platypus point of view. In addition, of course, we've changed the actual structure of many of our waterways uh, very, very dramatically. So, for example, in many places, we've built very large dams. And as a result, we don't get the natural flows that uh, traditionally we should have. So consequently, in some of our, our river systems, the, the, the annual flow patterns, the seasonal flow patterns are basically almost upside down on what they would have been traditionally. As a result, particularly of urban expansion, we've lost a lot of natural drainage. It's been alienated in a way that makes it unsuitable for platypus, as you can see in the, the top right there. But of course, the, big, the biggest problem is probably the fact that we are still over, har over harvesting our water resources. And I guess we've all seen the pictures recently of what the Darling River looks like, uh, where it's basically now just a chain of, of unconnected, uh, muddy, green looking, slimy pools. And if you're a platypus, that's not only reduced your habitat for feeding and so on, but also means that to get from one pool to another, you've got to cross over land and be at risk of predators. So all of those sorts of things have really started to, to hit platypus in many of our catchments. In addition, we've got issues of predation. Now, prior to European settlement, uh, there probably weren't that many natural predators. Uh, birds of prey perhaps sometimes took platypus. Uh, when there were big Murray cod around, there's been evidence that when uh, they were slit open, there'd sometimes be platypus inside those. But in general terms, the amount of predation probably didn't make an impact on populations. But of course, we've changed that in particular by bringing in predators like the red fox. And consequently, they now take quite a heavy toll on platypus numbers. And it's a significant problem in some areas. But it's not foxes, it's not dogs, it's not cats. It's still people who kill platypus in many direct ways. Um, here you can see some of the, the ones related to fishing. Now, let me make, make it clear, I'm not anti-fishing, and I think the vast majority of anglers are quite responsible in the way they go about things. But unfortunately, there is a small, but nevertheless quite substantial section of, of the recreational angling community who do not do the right thing. And so you get things going on like the, the illegal use of nets, that one in the top left there, is a gill net. Um, when that was found, it had eight dead platypus in it. More importantly, the ones that really kill a lot of platypus uh, are the various types of enclosed yabby nets. So typically the, the opera house trap that you can see on the top right there. Now up to five platypus have sometimes been found in a single opera house trap. And some of the other enclosed yabby traps are even worse. The, the other one you can see there is that then when that was found, it actually had seven dead platypus in it. Now, if you bear in mind what I said earlier, the platypus don't occur in large numbers. Um, if nets are left there over a long time, as this one was, 
uh, it can knock a fairly big hole in a population. Now, the good news is, is opera house traps are now banned in the ACT and in New South Wales, as from the 30th of April. And we've already seen when the ban was brought into Victoria in 2019, that number of deaths dropped dramatically. Um, however, it will take a long time for these nets to uh, disappear from the system. Hundreds of thousands of them were sold, and I'm certain there will be many, many still in use. So if you are out walking by a river and you see typically a piece of string leading down into the water from the riverbank, uh, that's often the clue that it's there's a, a net there that's set underwater. So pull it in and just see if it's a, an illegal enclosed net, net and report it to the fisheries officers. Other sorts of things, the big problem, I guess, is discarded fishing line. As you can see on the, the one on the bottom left there, uh, fishing line, uh, if you go to almost any popular fishing spot, you will see links of line and it gets around platypus and causes horrendous injuries and inevitably death. And another big problem is platypus often get hooked through the bill or the webbed feet. Uh, people don't know what to do. They cut the line and the platypus swims off and the line eventually gets snagged on something and they, they drown or die of exhaustion. The bigger problem though, perhaps, is litter. Um, platypus get an amazing amount of things around them because they're swimming along the bottom, uh, looking for, for food on the bottom. If there is any litter items at all, and particularly any circular ring type uh, things, uh, their streamlined shape means that the, the litter goes over their head really easily and they find it really difficult to get it off. And in some waterways, the, the uh, litter rate in urban areas can be quite frightening. I mean, we've just done a, a paper in uh, that analysed our, our findings around Melbourne. And what we found is that in the Melbourne area, at any one point in time, 4% of platypus had something or other caught around them. So basically one in 25 animals. But the actual rate in some particular waterways was, was absolutely frightening in terms of some of the, the inner suburban waterways. We found that as many as 30 to 40% of the population uh, had litter around them at some point in their lifetime. All sorts of things. And particularly uh, on the bottom right there, you'll see the one that's really emerging as quite a significant problem, and that is elasticated hair ties. Uh, the little platypus above uh, on the top right, uh, that was found with those three hair ties around it. The, the animal was a juvenile. She'd only been out and about for probably three to four weeks. It already picked up three of those in that point in time. And you can see the horrendous injury that was caused around her neck and that poor animal had to be euthanized. And so that in itself is just a, a real you know, indictment to us that we really have got to do better with litter. And particularly in urban areas like Queen Vianne, it's an issue we've got to face up to. Before I move on to monitoring platypus, let me just put in a, a, a bit of a plug for this guy. <laughs> this is the Australian water rat, uh, or better known by its uh, Aboriginal name, Rakeley. And we say to people, look, don't even think of it as a rat, think of it as Australia's version of the otter, because it has many of the features that uh, make otters a cute animal on every other continent. It actually fills the same sort of environmental niche. It's the, it's the top uh, aquatic carnivorous mammal, uh, but it has many of those otter-like features. So if you look at the bottom right there, you'll see those fabulous set of whiskers, quite small ears, quite a bluntish silver head. Uh, above it on the, on the top right, you'll see webbed feet, uh, webbing between the toes, exactly like an otter does. On the bottom left, you'll notice the beautiful fur, just like an otter, but notice the shape of the tail. This isn't a strappy, ratty sort of tail. This is quite a conical shaped tail, just like otters have, to both store fat and serve as a rudder. And the animal actually sort of swims a bit like an otter as well. So it's a, a quite attractive animal. And we're lucky in the Queen Bean area and the ACT in particular, that we've got uh, Rakeley uh, quite commonly in our waterways as well. Now, with the platypus getting into this category, becoming near threatened, we really need to get on top of monitoring how populations are doing across our different river systems so that we can take action in a timely way. And particularly, uh, given the predictions that climate change might make some of our waterways less uh, with less water in, it's going to put more pressure on platypus and we need to look at how we can compensate for that. So how do you go about checking 
in on platypus? Well, the traditional sort of gold standard for research is to do live trapping surveys. And to do that, you set special survey nets and then work right through the night, checking the animals, taking them out of the nets, inspecting them and so on. And it's, it's a very uh, good quality data comes out of it uh, in that you can check the males from the females, the adults from the juveniles, check their condition, as you can see, by squeezing the tail there, you can tell how good a condition the platypus is and various other things. However, the downside is it's a very technically demanding activity. It really can only be carried out by experienced biologists who are working in accordance with research permits and ethics committee approvals and so on. The equipment is quite expensive. Um, it takes a long time to do the work. You work basically 24 hours nonstop. And it uh, can only really satisfactorily be carried out in fairly shallow conditions. There is a technique you can use in deep water, uh, but it isn't as effective for sampling populations. So when you're talking about the Queen Bianca River, where much of it is, is too deep for these sort of nets, there are limitations as to what you can do. So are there other things? Well, one of the possibilities that's emerging is using is, is cameras. And the good news is that until, until this week, in fact, uh, promising, it hadn't been very promising. Uh, it was felt that both platypus and Rakeli floated too low in the water to trigger cameras. And so the only time they were showing up was when you get a situation like in the top picture there, where a platypus had come out on a log to have a bit of a scratch and actually trigger the camera. But this week, somebody in Tasmania has been experimenting with different cameras and different camera angles. And as you can see in the bottom uh, picture there, it's actually now starting to show up platypus when they are swimming. So this is a real breakthrough and we hope that that can be exploited further. So we're actually working with a person to do more research and see whether we can start using that much more widely and effectively. Another technique that you may have heard of is, is environmental DNA or eDNA. Um, and if you're not certain what it is, basically it's very similar to the when you see the crime show, uh, crime scene shows on TV where the police solve the problem by getting a tiny fragment of DNA from the perpetrators. Same principle, you take uh, samples of water under sterile conditions, send it off to a lab and push it through a black box, which uh, will look for traces of platypus DNA. And so it's a technique that's, I guess, a bit more uh, what you can use it much more widespread and cost effectively than live trapping. You can do a lot more sampling in, a, in the same, uh, uh, same amount of time. But uh, at this point in time, it's not necessarily very useful for actually monitoring populations because what it's basically telling you is presence absence. Um, it's not telling you how many platypus are in an area. And it's also uh, a bit unknown as to whether if you get a negative, does that really mean there's no platypus there or does it simply mean that there's not been enough DNA found in the sample to really do positives. But nevertheless, it's an evolving technology that hopefully will get better. Another important aspect of keeping track of platypus is collecting sightings reports. And I can't stress how valuable, you know, every time you see a platypus or a rakeli, that it is important to report it. Um, it does particularly give us a good idea of distribution, in other words, where platypus occur. However, there are some, some limitations to it. One, of course, is the problem that it's very easy to make mistakes with sightings. You can confuse platypus for Rakeli and so on. And of course, if you get the sort of websites that exist where people can simply enter their own sightings directly, it's very much open to uh, abuse. And so, for example, in the middle there, you'll see a, a sample from, from one website where people can just go in and enter it. And it reads, my son took a photo inside a hollow log and discovered a platypus. Well, of course he did because he put his toy platypus inside and took a photo. And then that ends up as a platypus result. Now, of course, that's not what we want to achieve. The other problem though, more importantly, is the data from sightings is not standardized and we can't use it to track populations. Now, if you look at this, this, graph, this is a, a, a great report that Beth uh, produced last year on platypus and recurrently monitoring in Queen Bianca. So looks at the, the results of uh, how many sightings are coming in and uh, Beth and I will be working on the next year's one to make certain that we 
try and bring all the signings information together. Um, so you can see it produces some useful information. If you look at that graph there, you'll see that the light green uh, on the bottom uh, left graph shows the sort of uh, period when Rakeli are most likely to be seen. You can see it's this period now coming, coming through the winter when they are most active. Um, by comparison, platypus numbers start to really peak in the August, September period when the breeding season is, is underway. And by collecting that information, it's given us a much better idea of these seasonal patterns that these species uh, have. However, in terms of actually monitoring populations, it's, it's because it's non-standardized, we have to be a little bit careful. So you'll see that in 2020, for example, there was an 87% increase in platypus sightings and a 310% increase in Rakeli sightings. Now, it would be nice to think the population has actually grew by those amounts. But of course, the problem we have is that sightings in this way really reflect you know, just how many people sometimes are out there looking and also doesn't necessarily reflect how many times they saw platypus relative to the number of times they looked. Did they see one platypus for one look or was it one platypus for 500 looks? And so it's not standardized. It makes it difficult to draw too many conclusions about population trends. So what can we do about that? Is there a way of standardizing it? Well, the answer is yes. We've been working, the platypus conservancy has been working for about over 10 years now on trying to get a system up that addresses this issue. And we've now launched this called the Australian Platypus Monitoring Network. And we think it's the next generation of citizen science because it tries to bring a standardized ratio to what people are doing. It, it has its genesis in, in the, the lady on the top right there is called Lynn Easton. Lynn uh, did a pilot project for us in the, in the early 2000s. Um, and Lynn, uh, collected a lot of information about where, when she saw platypus and when she didn't. And as a result, we were able to plot her, her data. And we found that what she was seeing in the top graph there of the number of platypus she was seeing per time she looked uh, was very similar to what we got from trapping survey results in the same area. Um, so she was picking up exactly what we were seeing in live trapping surveys, but a lot more cost effectively, not as in much detail, but was nevertheless scanning, uh, was getting results that indicated the, the figures over time. But also when we started to expand the system and got people working in different areas, we also were able to pick up differences in abundance. And so it gave the basis for uh, tracking populations using the fact that everybody was doing the same thing. Now, what do they do? What's it based on? It's a very simple system. Um, People who want to get involved choose their visual survey site. Some people just have one, other people have several. So Lynn has three, for example. We've got one volunteer in Tasmania who has eight. Um, and what people do is they stop at their site, hopefully at least once a week, sometimes more. Um, some people go out five, six, seven, seven times a week. But even if you can only do it once, it still contributes useful information and they scan for a set period of five minutes. Now that might not sound a lot, but for various reasons, which I'll explain later, in a five minute period, if there is a platypus there, you have a very, very good chance of seeing it. And so therefore it doesn't need to be a time consuming process. It's something that people fit in with their, their other activities, such as walking the dog along the river or going for a jog or walking to cycling to work and so on. You carry out the scan when it suits you, although early morning and late afternoon are prime time and our computer can adjust for all those sort of things. And the key to it is people record both the positives and the negatives. So in other words, if you see two platypus in 10 scans, that gives you your score of 0.2 that can be compared over time and can be compared from place to place. And so we've done this now for a long period over trials and it works. And basically what you then do is end your results on a website. Um, you can either do it through your computer or through an app and that immediately creates uh, feedback. You can look at sites, see what the results are. And if there is enough data, if there are 20 data points per quarter, you can then start generating graphs of how the population is doing. So it's a very simple system, but it's very effective. You can either adopt an existing site or you create a new one. 
If you are on private land and you've got a river running through it and you want your site on private land, um, that's fine. And you can actually then specify as private so that other people can't adopt that site. So that you're not inviting other people to come on your land. In Queen Bien, there's the good news is that it's already many uh, existing sites that have been monitored over several years in some cases. Uh, they're not all shown on that map, but if you go to the website and look under findings, you'll see where the sites are. And to give you an idea in Queen Bien, how likely are you to see platypus? Well, let me stress, you're not going to see platypus every time you go out. And what you've seen from the graphs about platypus occurrence during the year, there are certain periods of the year when you will see them more often, particularly during the breeding season. But just to give you a rough idea there, the, the, the site which is by the suspension bridge in Isabella Street um, has it's been monitored for several years. There's a lot of data there and the figure is 0.26. So in other words, really for every time, for every four times people scan there, they see a platypus, which is a fairly, fairly highish figure. And you see for that whole section of, of um, the river there that goes up to about Dane Street and Carabar, um, it really averages about that 0.25 figure. So, so one in four over the year or over the period. Um, it varies from year to year, of course, and that's whole part of doing it. In terms of choosing a monitoring site, well, yeah, I said that we would encourage people to choose the existing ones. It's better that people share sites because there's more data and there's more uh, cover if people are off. But you can choose new sites. You can register a new site anywhere. Um, very easy to do. But what the things you look for, it's got to be convenient for you. You don't want to be traveling an hour to somewhere because you won't do it. So that makes it somewhere convenient. Um, you want to be able to view a sizable stretch of water. So in other words, about a 50 metre, up to about a 50 metre stretch, open stretch where you can see comfortably. And basically, um, you want to choose somewhere where there is a reasonable chance of seeing platypus. So I mean, you can choose small creeks and you can choose some fairly degraded conditions, um, but it may get a bit disappointing that you don't see platypus very often. But in Queen Bian, we know there are sites there that are going to be very productive and we certainly encourage people to give it a go. If you haven't seen platypus in the wild before, just let me quickly explain what to look for because what I said earlier, they can be seen very easily. It's the ripple pattern that gives them away. Platypus spend a lot of their time feeding um, and basically what you see is when they, they, they dive underwater, fill their cheek pouches with food, and come to the surface and then float in one place while they mash their food up and take a breath. So the first thing you'll see is those uh, pictures on the top there where they pop to the surface and they float uh, in still water conditions. They'll, they're, they're, uh, you'll see quite a circular ripple pattern around them. If it's a flowing river, if it's, uh, they'll always face upstream. And as a result, will create sort of an inverted V will flow around them. And that's very obvious. They'll be on the surface for 10 to 15 seconds. They then take a little duck dive. You can see on the bottom left there. Again, that might be the first thing you see is this little hump in the water very briefly. They then force their way down to the bottom and that creates quite a strong updraft. And that in turn creates quite a strong ripple pattern. And sometimes with little bubbles in the middle where the air is being forced out of their fur. They'll be underwater for typically 30 to 50 seconds at a time, sometimes more, sometimes less, and then they pop back to the surface and the whole sequence starts again. So in a five minute period, you'll have six, seven opportunities to see that sequence and with all the various ripples that it creates. And so if there is a platypus there um, and you're prepared to just scan carefully for that period, you have a very, very high chance of seeing it. And that's why you only need five minutes. If the weather conditions are a bit poor, if it's raining or windy or there's a fast flow, you can extend it up to 10 minutes just to give your eye a bit more chance to, to settle in. But we don't really um, need people standing there for hours. <laughs> I warn you that people do, people do get addicted. Once they start seeing platypus, they do start wanting to spend hours and hours and hours there. So you'd have to be aware of that. But basically five to 10 minutes. The other thing that happens, platypus do occasionally swim from place to place, particularly during the breeding season. In the bottom left there, you'll see males, one zooming along one way, one zoom in the other, creating quite a strong ripple uh, uh, wake behind them. And again, that might be the first thing you see. 
The other thing you have to be a little bit careful of, it's very easy to confuse platypus and rakele. They're both basically similar in size. A big rakele is the same size as a small platypus. They're basically the same color. They, they do vary in color a bit, but when they're in the water, they all basically look brown. And they can be mistaken. But once you know what you're looking for, it tends to be fairly obvious that water rats tend to float, that tend not to float in one place in the way that platypus do, and they pop to the surface. They swim much more continuously. When they dive, they do a much more shallow sort of racing dive than a platypus does. They don't create such strong ripple patterns, and they really are uh, easy to see once you get started. So look, if you are interested, what we strongly suggest to people is go to the Australian Platypus Monitoring Network site and have a look for yourself. Everything I've described is in more detail there, including more tips on how to spot platypus. And if you're interested, I'll give it a trial first, but if, you, if you're interested, register as a volunteer. You then select your sites. And what I said earlier, we would certainly encourage you to uh, adopt the existing sites, but fine if you want to establish your own. And then simply you start scanning and upload your data. And then as soon as you start uploading data, you will be able to start watching for the, the longer term trends if you produce enough data during the time. If you can't get involved in uh, APMN, we still encourage you to look out for platypus and particularly report sightings. Now, you can either report them uh, to uh, the local council, uh, and Beth, as I said earlier, we'll, we'll be collecting those and we work together to produce an annual summary. If you're not in the Queen Bean area and want to report to, to uh, us, the Australian Platypus Conservancy, that's very easy as well. You simply go to our website. Um, the important thing though is that uh, make certain that if you use any other method, the data ends up in the Atlas of Living Australia. The Atlas of Living Australia is the national database all our information uh, gets sent there. And unfortunately, there are some websites around where you can report platypus sightings that do not share it with ALA. And we strongly uh, think that's a, a mistake. You can report directly to ALA yourself through a scheme called iNaturalist. Um, and that's uh, another option. But whatever you do, either go to the council, go to the APC or report directly to, to ALA. Okay, now I've covered a fair bit and it's time for questions.